Good evening. So glad y'all are here tonight. How many of you would really, really like to see Emmanuel Baptist Church move forward? Amen. Amen. Good. Well, we're standing. I want you to move forward. There's <laughs> lots of lots of seats up here that we can all get together and uh, get rid of these back row Baptists. Uh, there's an old there's an old chorus I love to sing. It's called "Think About His Love." Would you stand together as we sing that? Think about his love, think about his goodness, think about his grace that's brought us through, for as high as the heavens above, so great is the measure of our Father's love. Of great is a measure of Father's love. Ida, Think about his love, think about his goodness, think about his grace that's brought us through, for as high as the heavens above, how great is the measure of our Father's love. Great is the measure of our Father's love. Bless the Lord, O my soul, O my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O my soul. I'll worship Your holy name. Sing it, ladies, just the ladies. The sun comes up. When the evening comes. Good job, ladies. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. Here we go, guys. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Sing it loud. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Oh, my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and forevermore. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship His 
his holy name Sing like never before Oh my soul, I worship your holy name Lord, I worship your holy name Good singing, you may be seated Welcome to Emmanuel Southern Baptist Church this evening. Is it not great to be in the house of the Lord? What a great song we just sang. And isn't it awesome to sing songs that are based on scripture? Let me read Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5. My soul, bless the Lord, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. My soul, bless the Lord, and do not forget all his benefits. He forgives all your iniquity. He heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with faithful love and compassion. He satisfies you with good things. Your youth is renewed like the eagle. That's a great song. If you didn't notice, there's somebody here that that's their favorite song. Did you hear Ryder? Loud and proud. So appreciate Ryder singing that out for us. I didn't hear Brylan from up front here, but he was singing it too. That's good. That's awesome. Well, once again, thank you for being here this evening. Uh, Let's continue to invite people to come out. Flyers on the table at the back, and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the opportunity to be in your house, to worship you in song, and to soon to worship you through the study of your word. I just pray that you'd guide and direct all that we say and do this evening, and it would bring honor and glory to you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Lou Newer Westerns is is a he's a cowboy western writer. Always really clean, never hurt the lady, but uh it's the guys that go into the bar, or saloon, whatever, and some of the rough hands that come up to you and said, uh, partner, uh, I didn't get your name. And Louis the Moore would say, that's because I didn't give it to you. <laughs> There's something back, especially you go back into the, the Jewish culture, to have, know someone's name meant that you could identify with them. Now, when Moses was sent to tell Pharaoh, and what did he say? Well, who am I going to say? sent me what was, what did god say his name would be I am. I am that i am that's enough isn't it but his name is something we're singing about tonight and we're going to sing uh, the old hymn blessed be the name uh and we're going to kind of i call it country fine oh for a thousand tongues to sing Blessed be the name of the Lord, the glory of my God and King. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name name of the Lord. I never shall forget that day. Blessed be the name of the Lord. When Jesus washed my sins away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Jesus, name above all names. Blessed be glorious Lord. Emmanuel, God is with Blessed Redeemer, living word. Man, I sure got that low. My goodness. I will stay there anyway. 
Uh, uh, let's see. Joy, read your passage, please. No other name. Jesus, name above all names, beautiful Savior, glorious Lord, Emmanuel, God is with us, beautiful Savior, living Jesus, name above all names, beautiful Savior, glorious Lord, Emmanuel, God is with us, blessed Redeemer, living Word. Jessica. In his name, thank you. Jesus, name above all names, wonderful Savior, glorious Lord, Emmanuel, God is with us, you As morning dawn and evening fades, you inspire songs of praise that rise from earth to touch your heart and glorify your name. Your name is a strong and mighty tower. Your name is a shelter like no other your name let the nation sing it louder because nothing has a power to save but your name would you stand together and finish that song with me jesus in your name we pray Come and fill our hearts today. Lord, give us strength to live for you and glorify your name. Your name is a strong and mighty tower. Your name is a shelter like no other. Your name. Let the nation sing it louder, because nothing has a power to save. Your name is a strong and mighty tower. Your name is a shelter like no other. Your name, let the nation sing it louder, because nothing has a power to save. Your name. Is a strong and mighty tower. Your name is a shelter like no other. Your name, let the nation sing it louder. 
Nothing has a power to save. Nothing has a power to save. Nothing has a power to save but your name. Would Jim receive our offering this evening? Then we come forward to take up an offering. This offering is uh, a love offering for Dewey and Tom. Help them with uh, their expenses and, and to bless them for uh, coming to us, leading us in worship and uh, uh, preaching the word to us. Um, just appreciate them so much. So let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your name that is a strong tower lord just praise you for all of the names that you have lord that describe you over 85 different names in the bible used to describe you and the things that you do for us lord and we just praise you i pray now for this offering i pray that uh, you would use it in the ministry of dewey and tom and uh, bless bless them with it uh pray that you'd continue to bless uh, their time with us this week lord and uh i pray that uh you just your blessing upon them lord and i pray this in jesus name amen amen, amen. psalm 96 1 sing unto the lord you may be seated sing unto the lord a new song i don't know if you have sung this yet it hasn't appeared in hardly any publications yet but it's coming so you'll get a, a first-hand look at it. It's entitled, What He's Done. See, on the hill of Calvary, my Savior bled for me. My Jesus set me free. And look, at the wounds that give me life, grace flowing from his side, no greater sacrifice. You know it. What he's done, what he's done, all the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven, my future's in heaven. I praise God. For what he's done Sing for the freedom he has won Even death is dead and done His life is overcome Speak, say the name above all names Over every broken place He is risen from the grave what he's done, what he's done. All the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven, my future's in heaven. I praise God for what he's done. Now, on a throne of majesty, the Father's will complete. He reigns in victory. Sing hallelujah to the King. He is worthy to receive all the worship we, we bring. What he's done, what he's done. All the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven. My future is heaven. I praise God for what He's done. What He's done. What He's done. All the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven. My future is heaven. I praise God for what he's done. I praise God for what he's done.
for what he's done and hasn't he done much I told him to be sure and take the right bottle of water because we don't know which one for sure, but we think there's a possibility that Chris put some kind of vodka or something in one of the bottles. And uh, whichever, whichever one of us starts sounding like a Pentecostal, we got the bottle. Well, it's good to be back with you tonight. I, I don't know whether Chris told you or not, but my preaching has the effect of cutting the congregation in half. And so, but it was a great crowd this morning, and I think it's a great crowd tonight. I think for an evening service, this is a wonderful crowd. And uh, on Sunday evening. Uh, so if you, uh, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to get there in just a moment. Why don't you go ahead and open to Luke chapter 5, and we'll get back to Luke chapter 5 in a little bit. I want to talk about, uh, I've had three or four titles when I thought about doing this message, and, uh, and, and I thought about one of the titles, I thought about waiting in over your head. And, and another title I thought about was launching out into the deep, and I thought, well, maybe I should go with launching out into the deep. And uh, the, the setting for this, and let me just read the first couple of verses of Scripture, and then I'll come back and talk about it. Uh, in chapter 5, verse 1 and 2 and 3. So it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Let me stop right there. When you look at, in the Bible at the uh, Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Gennesaret, the Sea of Tiberias, they're all the same place. It's just that Tiberias built a, 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 a castle there, and so it began to be called the Sea of Tiberias. And Gennesaret was another name that they gave it. So all three of those are the same place. When you're looking in the Bible and reading the Bible, and it talks about the Sea of Gennesaret, or the Sea of Tiberias, or the Sea of Galilee, you're talking about the same place. Now, that was confusing to me when I was a teenager. I'd, I'd read one place, and I thought, well, that's, where the, where's that one at? And, uh, and, so, and nobody ever explained to me that they were all the same. They just had different names because of different reasons. But uh, the, the setting of this is that Jesus had already uh, been involved in ministry. Uh, he had, uh, he had uh, gone through a time where uh, he had uh, gone to the temple as a 12-year-old boy or somewhere along that, we think he was 12 years old. I think the Bible might say that. And, uh, and he kind of uh, flabbergasted, if you will, the scholars at the temple because he was speaking about things that they really didn't understand as well as he did. Now, it's really terrible when you get a professor who knows everything and a 12-year-old comes in and starts talking to him about things he doesn't understand. That's kind of frustrating to the professor. But that's what was happening. And the setting of that is that uh, it had been a feast time, and so uh, Joseph and Mary and the entourage that they had, uh, they had brought to Jerusalem were on their way back home, and, uh, and, and on their way back home, somewhere out there, they discovered that Jesus wasn't in the crowd with them. And so they went back looking for him, and when they found him, he said, don't you understand that I should be about my father's business? And that's kind of the first hint that we know of in the Bible that Jesus gave to his parents of, of what he was about. Now, Mary already knew this. She knew this beyond any shadow of a doubt because the Holy Spirit had talked to her at inception of Jesus. So she knew something was going to happen. I love the song, by the way, that uh, Mark Lowry wrote, uh, Mary, Did You Know? Uh, because uh, in that song, Mary, did you know that one day your baby boy would also be your Savior? I, I love that song. But, uh, but they, they were not quite picking up. They weren't connecting all the dots yet. And, and Jesus said to them, but I must be about my father's business. So he had already gone through that. He had been through the baptism. He went down to the river, and, uh, and he said to John, I need to be baptized. John was baptizing for the repentance of sin, and, and uh, the kingdom is coming. And he looked at Jesus. He knew that Jesus had no sin. John was a cousin to Jesus. You do know that, don't you? Because Elizabeth was pregnant at the same time that 
Mary was pregnant. And when Mary came to see Elizabeth, the Bible says that John in Elizabeth's womb jumped when Jesus came in. So John knew who Jesus was. He knew that he was here in order to become the Savior of the world. And when he, he knew that there was no sin in his life, John understood theology. He understood that we all are born into a, a fallen race. And because of that fallen race, we all bear the sins of mankind. When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden and God threw them out, God came to them, the Bible says, in the cool of the evening. And he said, to Adam, where are you? And Adam said, I'm here behind the bush. He said, Adam, why are you hiding? He said, because I'm naked. He said, Adam, who told you you were naked? Adam didn't have to be told he was naked. He sinned. And all of a sudden, because of that sin, he understood that he was a sinner. And he realized that in the, in the sight of God, he was no longer pure. So Adam and Eve sinned, and they became the mother and father of the nation that developed out of that. And from that point on, every individual uh, that was born into this world, with the exception of Jesus, the virgin birth, inception by the Holy Spirit, Jesus did not come into the world like we came into the world. He came into the world perfect. And so when he came down for John the Baptist to baptize him, John said, no, I'm not going to baptize you. And Jesus said, John, suffer it to be so that all righteousness might be fulfilled. Now, if you haven't followed Jesus in believer's baptism, you haven't fulfilled all righteousness. We as Baptists believe that there comes a time in life after you accept Jesus Christ that you need to follow him in believer's baptism. And we even say this is the very first act of obedience that one can do. And we even go so far as to say that before you take the Lord's Supper, because the Lord's Supper is one of our church ordinances, before you take the Lord's Supper, you need to be baptized because you've been instructed to follow him in baptism. And if you haven't followed him and, and, and uh, you've had a chance to follow him, you sinned. You're already disobedient because you've not followed him. Now, we only have two ordinances. You know that, don't you? We, uh, uh, we have two ordinances. Some of the other Baptist denominations, especially the free will, and I love the free will, by the way. I've got good friends there, and so I don't mean anything negative about them, but they also observe foot washing as an ordinance. And uh, I, was, I was on a camping trip with a friend of mine named Calvin Miller. Calvin and I were floating down the Niobrara River. We were both many, many years younger than I am now. And uh, we were floating down the Niobrara River, and we spent the night on a little rock bar, kind of a sandy rock bar. It wasn't big rocks. It was little bitty rocks. And uh, we spent the night there, and I said, Calvin, I need to ask you a question. I had not finished my college yet, and Calvin was already working on his doctor's degree. I said, I need to ask you a question, Calvin. I said, why do we have two ordinances and not three? I said, Jesus commanded us to wash feet. Why do we only observe two? And Calvin said, do it. It's very simple. He said, we believe an ordinance, a church ordinance, is something that Jesus has commanded us to do and that it shows a part of the gospel. In other words, the virgin birth, the sinless life, the death on the cross, the resurrection, coming back again, going to the Father. He said it shows some aspect of the gospel. He said, the Lord's Supper shows aspects of the gospel because we do this in observance of him, the shed blood and the broken body. He said baptism shows the gospel because when we're baptized, we go down in the water because Jesus died and was buried in the grave and we're symbolizing the fact that he came forth from the dead and we go down in the water because we believe that we have died to sin and we are resurrected to walk in newness of life. Have you ever heard pastors say when you put somebody under and he raised them back up again, he says, and resurrected to walk in newness of life, buried with him in the likeness of his death, and resurrected to walk in newness of life. Well, that's what that's all about. I said, oh, you're trying to make sense now, Calvin. I believe I got it. So we have those church ordinances, and the church ordinance is that we be baptized and that we also uh, partake of the Lord's Supper. So Jesus had already gone through the baptism. He had gone through the wilderness experience. Uh, and the other Gospels tell us that he had already shown power of healing in other places before this time happened on the Sea of Galilee. So Jesus had already gathered a great following of people. And according to what I read a moment ago, and what I'm going to read in just a second, there were a lot of people who were coming out. Mark's gospel tells us that the multitudes came. They came from as far as north to an idiom in the south. 
but all across there for 50, 60, 70 miles in each way, they came down to Jerusalem and up, I mean, up to uh, Galilee to listen to him speak. And there were, there were no phones. There was no internet. There was no way of contacting. It was just person to person contact. They talked about Jesus and what Jesus had done and what Jesus was doing. And it drew such a response of the people that they started gathering around him. Now listen as I read the remainder of this passage of Scripture. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let your nets down. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your will, a word, I will let down my net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Father, I pray tonight that you will take the reading of your word, and Lord, that you will just burn this into our hearts tonight, that we might recognize the lessons that you have for us in this particular passage of Scripture. For we ask it in Christ Jesus' name, and for his sake, amen. The scenario that I'm talking about is where Jesus saw the boats. The fishing was already over. Uh, they had caught nothing. They were on the bank mending the nets. Now, if you've ever fished, uh, you know that sometimes the net will break in a certain place, and when you try to pick the fish up out of the water, he just goes right through the net. Well, that was the case with them and their nets. They didn't fish the way we do today. There was nobody out there with a casting rod flipping it like that. They fished by throwing the nets out, and, and I don't know how in the world. I got, a guy like me couldn't do it. But a guy that had two hands probably could somehow master this. But they would take these large nets that had large pieces of metal on them like this all around the net. And they would take this thing and begin to sling it until it opened completely up. And they would throw it like a disc out into the water. And that net would start sinking with those. And as it got down to the bottom, it would have fish trapped in it. And when they started pulling, it was like pulling all those things together at the bottom and closing it up. And so they would pull that net in. And somehow, they had fished all night, and they'd caught nothing. But their nets were showing wear. And the Bible says they were mending nets and getting ready. Well, I don't think they had the nets completely mended yet, because when Jesus said, launch out into the deep, and they threw those nets out, they discovered that they caught more fish than nets would hold, and it even broke their nets. Now, that's kind of the scenario. That's the, that's the story behind what I want to talk about tonight. Uh, the, uh, the passage uh, out into the deep uh, is, is a passage that has really had meaning to me because it challenges me to get out of my comfort zone. All of us have a comfort zone. We all have somewhere where we feel very, very good. As long as we stay there, we feel good. That's true sometimes in church. You have certain things you do. For some people, they just come. They don't do anything else. For some people, they're willing to do a few things in church. For some people, they're willing to do others. But to launch out into the deep is to do something you're not comfortable doing. You're being asked to do something that you're not comfortable doing. Well, launching out into the deep is a command. Jesus didn't say to them, Would you guys like to go back out in the boat this afternoon and throw your net back in again and see what you catch? He commanded them, launch out in to the deep. You guys like to fish. Go out and do it. You know, there's, there's, uh, uh, there's probably as much understanding of the Word of God through revelation as there is through education. I never cease to be amazed. I, I have a reasonably good education. And I never cease to be amazed when I sit in Sunday school classes with teachers, adult teachers that have no theological education whatsoever. And yet because of revelation and because of the fact that they read the Word of God on a constant basis, God has given them wisdom into the Scriptures that is beyond what most people know. I love to sit and listen to someone teach 
who really understands what it is that the Bible is saying to us and brings that out because it just somehow resonates in my life. And so uh, when, when, uh, when, when Paul was writing to the Corinthian church and, and writing about doctrine, he said, uh, But God has chosen the f foolish things of this world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of this world to put to shame the mighty. So story first, foremost, it is about the calling of four disciples. Jesus is about to call these men to come and follow him. They're going to be his disciples. He's going to say to them at some point in their life, and not in this particular passage of Scripture, but he's going to say to them shortly after this, come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now that's true for every one of us. Come and follow me, and I will make you fish for men, and I will use the skills that you have already to help you fish for men. It's as simple as that. For fishermen, you'll be fishing for men. For mechanics, you might be working on a vehicle and talking to someone about Christ because of what this happens right here. You know, th this is hard to understand, but let me, t let me explain to you what's going on right here. I had my car in the shop before I came up here, and, uh, and, and the mechanic who's about, he's a really good friend of mine, and he used to be my worship leader in church and before they moved, and, uh, and he, he was explaining to me the car. And I wanted to say to him, Barry, don't you understand? Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before the swine. And brother, you're talking about things I don't understand. <laughs> I mean, he starts talking about all these lifters and cleaning and all the stuff he's doing on the top of this motor because the gas is coming in and the oil's getting mixed. And man, I, it was beyond me. I'm telling you, way beyond me. And he's sitting here with a computer looking at it. And I'm saying, Tom, can I just have my car back and you work on it when I get home? <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't need to know all this stuff. I'm never going to. But he could take that and he could talk to people about Christ because in that there is a clean life. He's cleaning up a motor. In that there is a clean life. Jesus calls us to a clean life. There's almost nothing you can do in life that you can't segue into the fact that you're going to be able to witness to someone about Christ. So Christ is calling these four guys. Now, they're not like us. Tom and I have fished together quite a bit, and, uh, and so far I haven't hooked anything in his ear, but he always thought I was going to because the boat's short. Watch that thing, Tom said. <laughs> but when we come back and we don't catch any fish, it's okay. You know, fishermen will tell you this. That's why we call it fishing and not catching. It's good to be on the water. We enjoy being out there. We enjoy doing things like this. And ever so often, we'll come in with zero fish, and that's okay. But it wasn't okay for these guys to come in with zero fish because they were professional fishermen. That was their living. If they didn't catch fish, they didn't eat. If they didn't catch fish, there was nothing there. So these guys were fishing for a living. Jesus was looking for a pulpit at this particular time because the Bible tells us in this scripture that it was a great crowd that had gathered from all over the area. They had come to see this man Jesus and what was going on with him, and they, they came to listen to him because he was speaking to them in, in ways that they, they could hear and understand. And, and they listened to him, and they loved to see the miracles that he was doing. They wanted to see these miracles firsthand, so they traveled everywhere to get to see them. And, and as Jesus was speaking to these people, they just kept gathering until finally the hillside that I talked about this morning, like, a, uh, like an amphitheater, was just filled with people, and the press got so great that Jesus had nowhere to stand. There was water behind him and people in front of him, and he looked at these guys, men in the net, and he said, I need one of your boats. Pull the boat out. And so they pulled a boat out, and he, he spoke to them. And then he said to them, launch out into the deep. Well, hey, Jesus was looking for a pulpit, and he found that in a boat. And we don't know how many people were there, but we do know from another one of the Gospels that the people followed him around the Sea of Galilee, and he crossed the Sea of Galilee. We know from another Gospel they followed him around. And we know that there was a time when he fed 4,000. We know there was a time when he fed 5,000. We don't know for sure how many 5,000 were because it was 5,000 men. And there is a possibility, according to those who study the, hist the history of everything, there is a possibility there was many as 16,000 people there. And Jesus said, we need to feed them. And they fed the whole group. Well, let me get off of that for a moment. Launching out into the deep is a command. 
But let me, let me move to the second point. Launching out into the deep requires faith. Now, I don't know whether you know it or not, but living by faith is something that not everybody is doing all the time. Living by faith is something that is required of us at certain times, and I can tell you because I've been there that talking about living by faith is a whole lot more fun than living by faith. When you have to live by faith, that's different. My wife and I left Arkansas in 1967 with three little children, and then we had a fourth, which we couldn't afford. And we got to Valentine, Nebraska, and I was trying to find ways that we could support ourselves because we had almost no money coming in, and, uh, and, and nobody was sending us money from the outside. It just had to come through the church, and the church didn't exist. I had my tithe when I got there, and one family who was there and their tithe, and so that rented the building the first month and paid for my salary, and the second month we had half my salary because that's all that the other family and I gave. And so we were living by faith. I was trying to find some way to get food. I had a family to feed, and I went down to... I, I told you I was a fisherman. I went down to the bait shop, and I said, what are people catching in, 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 these, in this river out here, and, and what are they using for bait? And he said, they're using these night crawlers. You know what a night crawler is? Big old long worm, looks like a snake. Well, he said, they're using these night crawlers. He said, I don't have any. He said, I'm out of them. I said, why don't you have any? He said, because I can't get them. And I said, well, I've only lived here for less than a month. But I said, my yard's full of these. I had the only yard in Valentine, Nebraska that had night crawlers coming up every night. I picked up night crawlers at night all the way through the summer, and that's how we bought groceries. We bought it from what we sold for, for the night crawlers. My wife became absolutely wonderful at being able to make anything stretch into a meal. The only thing we ever, ever tried that didn't work, don't ever try to make any kind of green tomato uh, that you make, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I can't think of the word now, but it's a pie that you make out of, minced meat pie. Don't ever try to make minced meat out of, out of green tomatoes. It's not edible. And, and, you know, not even the dog would eat it. We poured it out in the back. <laughs> Nothing would eat it. It was just not edible. But that was the only thing we tried to do that didn't work. And we just, we lived like that. I went out and hunted when the fall came and, and killed a deer every year. And, and I, you know, just miraculous things happened in our life. I, one year I couldn't go because I was out preaching in a revival, and they didn't pay me a whole lot, but it was enough to get down to Oklahoma and back again. And, uh, and I got back home, and I missed deer season. And that was, that was part of our food. And we were sitting at the table the last day of deer season on Sunday, and we had a knock on the door. We were eating lunch after the Sunday service, and a guy knocked on the door, and when I went to the door, I'd never seen him before in my life. And he said, are you Reverend Hickey? I said, yes, I am. He said, well, I understand that you won't hunt on Sunday. I said, no. He said, I understand you didn't get your deer this year. I said, no, I didn't. He said, would you accept a deer from a Seventh-day Adventist killed on Sunday that won't hunt on Saturday? I said, let's go get that deer. <laughs> let's go get that deer. Where is it? <laughs> we got our deer. I mean, God, God provided for us in ways that were just unbelievable. And so, But I'm telling you, it's more fun to talk about it than it is to live it. Living it is, uh, is hard to do sometimes. Uh, I, I was, uh, my wife was raising those three children, and then we had the fourth one shortly after we got there. And, uh, and I was 29 years old, and I, I have to confess to you, I, I really was a teenager, 29-year-old teenager. And, and uh, I found a, a guy that was harvesting potatoes in the, in the fall of the year, and I went out and told him that I would like to buy some potatoes for my family. And he said, okay. And he said, how much do you want? And I said, I'd like to have a 100-pound sack of potatoes. I said, how much are they? I've got $4. He said, well, they're more than $4. I said, well, I said, I want to buy $4 worth that 100-pound. He said, why can't you buy more than that? I said, I don't have any more money than that. He said, how many, how many children do you have? I said, four. He said, you and your wife and four children, six people. I said, yeah. He said, I'm going to sell you that 100-pound of potatoes for $4. And so he sold it to me. I went home, and I had this box in my, in my garage. This is the first winter that we lived in Valentine, Nebraska. And I poured that sack of potatoes in that box. And as the weather chilled down, I put a big blanket over the top of the box so they wouldn't freeze. I was Arkansas. I'd never lived in Nebraska, northern Nebraska, close to South Dakota. I didn't know it got down to 20 below zero. I didn't know everything in the garage froze at 20 below zero. And I was out in that garage over, that, over those potatoes, and they were, uh, they were beginning to thaw. They had frozen as solid as a rock. 
Have you ever been around thawed potatoes after they freeze? They really stink. I was out there moving those potatoes around, trying to find the hard ones that were still frozen so we could peel them, and, and trying, and I was crying. I mean, I was, I literally had tears shedding out my eyes, and because we lost our potatoes, and here's this 29-year-old teenager out there over that box of potatoes thinking, God, why did you do this to me? But God didn't do it. I mean, it gets cold every year. I should have had sense enough to know that. I'm going to shorten the story and tell you that I bent down over that, side, that, that box of t potatoes as a 29-year-old teenager, and I got up as a 29-year-old full-grown man. After God and I had the conversation, he reminded me that it wasn't his fault the potatoes froze. It was my fault the potatoes froze. All of a sudden, I began to, I began to grow up. And I came back in the house, and I told my wife, I said, Honey, I said, I need to start taking some responsibility in the family I haven't been taking. You know, it's hard for a woman to give over when she's had to do everything to give over to a guy who now wants to get in. And so, you know, it was hard on her. I mean, I, I said, I, I want to know how much money we've got. I want the checkbook. I want, we didn't have a checkbook. I, I want the money. And she said, what are you going to do with it? I said, I'm going to pay the bills. She said, I've been paying the bills. I said, yeah, but it's my responsibility. I'm the man. It's my responsibility. God's going to hold me accountable for this. And so it created a rift between my wife and I because she was not trusting that I would do this in a timely manner. But that box of potatoes kind of grew me up, and I, I became a, I became a full-grown man. Now, I, I want to say that uh, uh, from, uh, from a church perspective, uh, when the pastor says to a church, why don't we go out and blitz the community? And someone in the church says, well, pastor, we've done that before, and it didn't work. Can I just address that for a moment? We had a man come to visit our church in Westwood, and he was with us for two or three years before he moved on, moved away. But he came to church the first time, and I said to him, who invited you? And he said, you did. I said, I don't remember ever meeting you. He said, you never have. I said, how do I invite you? He said, for five years you've been hanging things on my doorknob. And he said, I finally decided I need to come check this place out. Five years. You never know when you do something what's going to work. Chris Coleman, a friend of mine in northwest Arkansas who's ministered in our church, came down and visited with us. And I know Chris because I've been with him in other ministries. And Chris has a great testimony. Chris's testimony is that he grew up in a non-religious family. His mom and dad were both drug addicts, and there were five kids. He said, Dewey, he said, do you know where that Piggly Wiggly used to be over here on Midland Avenue? I said, no, I didn't grow up here. He said, well, there was a Piggly Wiggly there. He said, that's where I stole food to feed our family. He said, I would go in there and steal food every, every week, every day, to feed my, my siblings. We would be in, in the park. Our mom and dad would come and pick us up. He said, sometimes we had a house to live in. Sometimes we lived in the car because there was no place to live. That was the way he grew up. He said, I was an atheist, full-born atheist. And he said, I walked into my mom and dad's house when I was about 22 years old. And he said, somewhere along the way, they had gotten a hold of a Jesus film. Have you ever heard of the Jesus film? They'd gotten a hold of a Jesus film. And he said, both of them were just back on the couch like this, wiped out on marijuana. He said, the ashes were still smoking in the, in the ashtray. And he said, that, that thing was playing on the, on the television. He said, I thought, well, they're not listening to this. I'll just take it home and listen to it myself. And he took that film out and took it home. And that night when he listened to it, he gave his life to Christ. He's in ministry today, by the way. His dad has accepted Christ. And he's got one of his siblings that's accepted Christ. After I heard that story, I said to our church, why don't we distribute the Jesus film in the community? And so we distributed in Greenwood, Arkansas, 3,800 film. We put on people's doors, knocked on doors and gave them to them. And one of my deacons said to me, how many people do you think we're going to have in church next week? And I said, probably none. Well, why are we doing this? I said, to be obedient to what Christ told us to do. He told us to go out and do this. So we're going to go out and do it. God is the one that's going to give the results. So if your pastor asks you to do a blitz, don't say we've, we've done that before and it never worked. Just do it and pray for it and see what kind of results God gives because we're not in charge of what God does. We're in charge of what we do, and God blesses us with the results. You see, launching out into the deep is the crossroads of faith and blessing. That's where they intersect. 
Simon the fisherman launched out into the deep. He let down his nets. He caught nothing. But when he let them down after Jesus told him to, he caught more than the nets would hold. And the Bible says when he came back to Christ, he fell on his knees and said, Lord, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. So launching out into the deep number three, it's, it gives direction, if you will, to our life. I'm trying to figure out a way to say this. Launching out into the deep changes the direction of our life. I think that's a better way to put it. Once we've experienced the abundance of God's blessings, our life will never, ever be the same again. I want to tell you the story of a friend that I made when I was in seminary. His name is Harrison Igwe, and Harrison came from Kenya. No, he came from Nigeria. Some of you are old enough to remember uh, the little country of Biafra where children were starving to death back in the what, 1960s or 70s, 80s, long in there. I think 60s and 70s when it was happening. Well, Harrison Igwe passed through a church in Nigeria that was running 1,500 in Sunday school. And he preached on home missions and gave the invitation. And he said he stood there waiting for someone to come forward out of that crowd of 1,500 people. And finally, one woman started forward. And it was his wife. And she walked up to him and said, Harrison, she said, God is speaking to me about missions. And Harrison said, God is speaking to me about it too. And he resigned the church, and they moved from there to Biafra. And in Biafra, I met, he was my friend in seminary. We met in seminary in the 1970s, and uh, he was my friend in seminary, and, and uh, we just had a lot of time together. I took him home with me, preached at my church sometimes, but I'd take him home with me on the weekends because it's a long ways to Nigeria. He couldn't go home. And so I'd take him home to, to my family on the weekends. But Harrison said that, uh, his, fi his family uh, died, and uh, his wife died, and all five of his children died of disease while he was there in Biafra. And then after they died, he said he was going across from one church that he had started to another one, and he said the Nigerian army picked him up, and they brought him in to a hut, and they set him down in the hut with ten other men, and he was on the end, and the army came in and took the first man out, stood him up, firing range, and they killed him. They came in and took the second man out, firing range, and they killed him. By the time they got down to about four or five, Harrison said, I already was beginning to cry because I knew that I had just a few moments left, and that would be the end of it. And he said, I, I was waiting for them to come and get me. He said, I was weeping because I knew death was coming right now. And he said, they came in and got me, one under each arm, and started out the door with me. And he said, the young captain came in and said, what are men doing? They said, we're, we're killing this man because he's a spy. And he said, no, 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 he's not a spy. He said, I was in his Sunday school. He said, he was my pastor. He's not a spy. He came here as a missionary. And Harrison said, they started giving food to him that was coming in. He said, it started ten churches across Biafra with the food that they gave to him, all because that one young captain came through the door and recognized him from the time he was there before. You know, God works in some miraculous ways. I mean, he, he, he can work in our lives in such an unusual way that, uh, that we just, uh, we're just fascinated by it. But on this particular time when Jesus said, launch out into the deep, well, you know, when I was standing over that box of potatoes and I was crying and telling God how it was unfair that my potatoes had frozen and it was his fault, God began to bring some verses of Scripture to my mind. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, and He is my deliverer. The God of my strength, whom I will trust. Though He slay me, Job said, I will trust Him. As for me, and I will trust you, O Lord. I will say to you, you are my God. Well, living by faith is really sometimes difficult, challenging to say the least. But when God has called you to live by faith, you have no choice but to take that step. You're launching out into the deep in what you do. I used to work with churches and pastors, 
and I worked with a lot of pulpit committees when they were calling pastors. And I remember on several occasions when they would ask me what is it we should pay our pastor, and I would always say the same thing. The standard answer I had was he'll preach well for $1,000 as he will for 100 That's my standard answer. You know, you should pay the pastor because he deserves what the church can give him. I remember one sweet lady, she really, really got angry with me, Bismarck, North Dakota, and she said, well, I believe pastors need to understand that they are called to serve regardless and they're supposed to suffer. And I said, and she said, and God will bless them for suffering. I said, why don't we spread this suffering around? Each one of us put in another hundred dollars and you can be blessed also. <laughs> and she didn't speak to me for over a year. I mean, she just got so angry. She got over it before I left Bismarck, and we became friends again. But, you know, somehow or other, that blessing needs to be spread around. Listen, when God calls us to launch out into the deep, we go and we do and we launch out. And sometimes it requires that we live by faith. Now, the other thing that I almost named this sermon uh, before I put the name on it was uh, walking by faith and... Uh, uh, and, and, you know, other than just waiting over my head, walking by faith. But I'll tell you one more time, it is a whole lot more fun to talk about walking by faith than it is to walk by faith. We are called to move out of our comfort zone as Christians. Do you have a lost person living somewhere in your neighborhood? It's not in your comfort zone more than likely to approach that lost person and say to them, can I tell you about Jesus? But God is calling us to move out of our comfort zone. Launch out into the deep. And the only answer we should have when God says launch out into the deep is at your word, Lord. I'll let the nets down. Father, I pray tonight.